I love the Bible, but I think one of my favorite things about the Bible is sometimes what's not there. Like all the spaces between the verses where we get to wonder and imagine about how we got from A to B. There's a lot of space in the Bible where the details are just sort of left up to our imagination. And one of those stories is the story of Jacob and Esau. Uh, Jacob is famously pretty terrible to his brother Esau, to the point where Esau actually threatens to kill him and Jacob has to run away. But as readers, we then follow with Jacob through all of his ups and downs and through his life and twists and turns to find out how Jacob gets to the end of the story. However, what we don't get to see is how Esau gets there. Because remember, at the end of the story, Jacob and Esau reconcile, and Jacob is sort of surprised that Esau is this gracious, wise, mature, healthy human being that reconciles with him and welcomes him home. But how did Esau get there? We don't really know as readers, and I think that opens up a lot of room for us to put ourselves into the story, to see our life off the page in between the verses where Esau is going through all kinds of different things and becoming the kind of person that maybe we want to be and maybe that Jacob never even expects at the end of the story. I think that gives a lot of freedom for us. And I was able to talk about this recently to sort of imaginatively riff on this idea that Jacob has been holding on to an old narrative about who his brother was from decades earlier. And I think that kind of imaginative work presents us with some questions. Are there people in our lives that we are holding on to old stories about? Maybe stories about who they were, maybe stories about how they must think about us, when the truth is those people have been going through just as much as we have. And when we give them the freedom to have their own story and to become their own person in their own way, I think that actually gives us the freedom to look back on ourselves with a lot of grace as well. We're all changing, we're all growing, we're all maturing, and sometimes we need to give ourselves and the people around us the freedom to start again with a new story. This is what I mean when I talk about our narratives slowly coming to define us, how powerful they can be in our lives, because it's been years, decades actually, since Jacob has seen his brother. And a lot has happened in the interim, right? Jacob literally wrestled an angel and saw the face of God and lived to tell the tale for goodness sake. And yet, here in this moment, about to meet his brother, the only story that Jacob has available to him is the one that took shape all those years ago when Esau was at his most vulnerable. For Jacob, Esau is still exactly who he was when in a moment of anger he lashed out in frustration. And maybe part of the problem here is that Jacob wonders if he's still that same person too. And so to avoid that story, he sends gifts, wave after wave in front of his face to build up a wall between himself and his past. And he looks up and there's Esau coming with his 400 men. So he thinks, well, this isn't good. So he divides his children among his wives, Leah and Rachel, and his two female servants. And he puts the female servants and their children in front, and Leah and her children next, and Rachel and Joseph in the rear. But he himself, he goes on ahead, and he bows down to the ground seven times as he approaches his brother. But Esau... When he sees Jacob in the distance, he runs to meet him and embraces him. He throws his arm around his neck and kisses him, and they wept together. And if that sounds familiar, by the way, that's because this is exactly the moment that Jesus has in mind when he tells the story of the prodigal son. Remember that one? A son that squanders his father's wealth on wild living and hits rock bottom and has nowhere to go. So he finally comes home, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and filled with compassion for him, he ran to his son, threw his arms around his neck and kissed him, Luke 15, 20. Jesus thinks Jacob is the prodigal in this story. Which, by the way, should also tell you something about how Jesus views our wealth, because Jacob is loaded at this point. But as Jesus tells it, he's hit rock bottom until he can reconcile with his brother. 
And just to make that point clear, this is how Esau responds to Jacob's generosity. Verse 8, Esau asked, what's the meaning of all these flocks and herds I met to find favor in your eyes, my lord, Jacob replied. But Esau said, I already have plenty, my brother. Keep what you have for yourself. That is not what I'm here for, Jacob. And this is what I find so fascinating about the entire Jacob story. Because Jacob is undoubtedly the protagonist of the tale, right? He's the one renamed Israel. He's where the entire nation gets its name, after all. But he is not the hero here. At least... Not the way we might expect. See, over and over and over again, we find him messing up his relationships and tripping over his own ambition. We see him hurt people that he should care about. We watch him figuratively and literally struggle with God. And the only consistent takeaway that I can possibly imagine from making this guy the nation's namesake is that as far as God is concerned, you are not now who you were then. The steadfast love of God is new every morning, and who you are now is not determined by who you were. But then, it's not just that, is it? Because if you're not your worst moment, then, well, neither is anyone else, right? And think about it here. We get to watch Jacob stumble and fall and pick himself back up again. We get to watch the moment where his attempt to buy his way back from the brink is completely unmasked by grace. But you know what we don't get to see? We don't get to see how Esau ends up here. I mean, the last time Jacob saw him, he was threatening to kill him. Careless scholars are describing him as something less than human as readers. We get one little snapshot where he heads off to marry a woman specifically because his dad doesn't want him to. And yet here, at the end of the story, reunited with his brother, it's Esau that surprises us. It's Esau that cuts through all the nonsense and the extravagance. It's Esau that steps through all the history and hard feelings. It's Esau that grants his brother what Jacob can't even imagine is possible. And it's not, it's not just a blind eye to what happened. It's reconciliation. It's repair from all the years that Jacob has carried around an old, old story about what he did to his brother and what his brother must think of him still. And that is made possible because there is a lifetime of healing and maturing and growth and transformation that takes place in Esau, and all of it happens off the page where we don't get to see it. And all the while... Jacob is still holding on to an old story about his brother from his worst moment 20 years ago. Esau's a radically different person, and Jacob thinks he's still who he was then. See, as much as this story is about how Jacob is more than his mistakes, it's also equally about how Esau is so much more than his hurt. And if you go back to the start of the story in chapter 27, and Jacob has just cheated him out of his birthright and stolen his blessing. Esau cries out in pain. He says, this is the second time he's taken advantage of me. Literally, he says, this is the second time he has Jacobed me. That's what he actually says in Hebrew. Because that's what he thinks of his brother, right? He's a no good, dirty, rotten scoundrel. And perhaps in that moment, he's not wrong. But the problem is, for some of us, we're still stuck way back there. And someone hurt us, or they betrayed us, they misrepresented us, they took something that wasn't theirs and they got away with it. But we didn't. And it's been years, and we're still holding on to all that hurt. I was taken advantage of, and I deserve my revenge. And sometimes what's happened is that old story has stopped us from moving forward in our story. And that moment, as painful as it was, has now become a narrative that's telling us things about ourselves. 
and things about all the people around us and things about who God is and things about how we can never trust again. And look, I'm not here to tell you when to let go. That's for you to work through. I have no idea when or where Esau came to the place where we reunite with him in chapter 33. That's his story, and apparently it was for him. Sometimes it takes all of us a very long time to get there, but I am going to suggest that at some point when the time comes and you've held on long enough and you've learned the lessons and you've grieved the pain, there will come a point where you just need to let go of it. And please hear me here. That does not mean you need to let your Jacob back in your life. There are some moments that relationships just simply can't come back from. I get it. What it means is that at some point you stop letting an old story tell you what's possible now. Because sometimes like Esau, when we're ready in God's grace, what we find is they're not who they were either. Hey, thanks for clicking on the video and watching through to the end of it. If you're intrigued by the work that we're doing here at Commons, we would love you to track along with us. You can hit the like and the subscribe and all of those buttons to stay up to date with everything that we're doing at Commons and what we're posting here on YouTube. Of course, you can find us on all the socials as well, but we're really grateful that you, even here on YouTube, are part of the journey. If you're interested in diving in deeper and even asking some questions, you can always leave a comment below or join our Discord where the community is talking about these things, wrestling together with the story of Jesus and the way that God is inviting us to move forward slowly, step by step, every day. Have a great week. We'll see you soon.